Okay, can you guys restart your um, clock? Clock, 14 minutes. Okay, all right, so this is where we left off, folks. So um, as I mentioned, these guys were were a pretty ingenious sort of culture of people. They, they were very adept at taking things from other cultures, absorbing them, making them their own, stylizing them for their themselves, and also improving upon them. So they, they, they borrowed stuff from the Persians, the various Mesopotamian cultures, the Egyptians, and one of the things that, that, that they did that these other people couldn't do is to, to get this sort of piped water, all right? Um, the architecture that they developed was the first large-scale architecture, because remember, most of Europe at, at, at this time, right, that the Minoans were in existence is about the time, I believe, that Stonehenge was built. And so people were living in little villages. There was no large centralized cities and cultures, right? And they were building stuff out of these big rocks, okay? Because I think Stonehenge occurred at about 2500 BCE, is my recollection, all right? So while the rest of Europe was building those type of stone circles and stuff, these guys were building fairly sophisticated palaces out of cut stone. They learned to cut stone from the Egyptians. One of the things I remember when when I when all this stuff was presented to me years ago when I was, you know, as I mentioned, when the pterodactyls would swoop on us as we walked through Building 7 at Cal Poly down to Building 2 and tried not to fall asleep inside of the very large room. Um, all this stuff was presented to me in these vacuums. And I, at that point, I never realized that Damn, these people kind of, they constantly conquered each other, and they visited each other, and they traded with each other. There wasn't that geographic and social perspective added to my understanding of the development of the architecture, which is crucial. Okay? All right. Um, so, uh, a discussion about entrances and ashlar masonry. Ashlar masonry is very precisely cut masonry. Okay? that they're stone blocks that are cut to fit together very, very precisely, all right? Um, they used uh, sandstone and limestone for the main walls while the interiors were um, essentially spanned with large wood beams. So one of the things about this culture is that they had more access to wood than the Egyptians, okay? Um, one of the things that, that people have theorized is that they they would build the foundations to these buildings out of rubble. Rubble is like basically boulders, but it's boulders of different sizes so that essentially if you have a large rock and another large rock and another large rock and another large rock, there's airspace between them, right? And so if you have smaller rocks, those smaller rocks work their way into those crevices. And then if you have smaller pebbles, they work themselves into that, and if you, were, if you have some sand in there, eventually you get a very dense sort of infilling of all of those little air spaces between things. By building those things, that stuff, when, there, when an earthquake came, at least this is one of the theories, would have some give to it. It wouldn't just immediately crack or sink, okay? And it would absorb some of the energy of the earthquake, all right? Um, they used, they had natural springs, and uh, they essentially were able to pipe water around, all right? So uh, that, that goes back to the whole water management. Um, the palaces had you know, fairly sophisticated water supplies and drainage systems for things like poo-poo and pee-pee, all right? Um, they had cisterns and wells. So a well is basically a big hole in the ground to pull water out of, right? A cistern is where you store water. All right, that becomes a, 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 an interesting sort of um, distinction. Um, they had sewers that were subterranean, that were underground. Which, think about it, this is back, this is just after the Stone Age. So these people were already making pipes at this time. They were in the Bronze Age while other portions of Europe were still in the Stone Age. Okay. 
one of um, the, the things that, that is often looked at when talking about uh, Minoan culture is the palace of King Minos of uh, legend. Uh, it is also known as the palace of Gnosis. And it was a huge structure. Uh, somewhere in, in one of the books that I used to reference, I have um, the gentleman that, that one of the authors of the book creates these these sort of relative sizes of things that are occurring in the same time periods. Uh, I'll try to find that for you guys because it's real interesting to kind of see how big this was compared to other structures that were being built at the time. So um, I don't have it now. I just thought of that as I was talking. But you can start to get an idea of what one of these administrative palaces was laid out like. There's a plan to one side, uh, and it, it, it covers a wide range of different uh, sort of spaces that are there. And then over here, you see the archaeological ruins that was then uncovered of it. All right. Here is an image of what um, it potentially looked like. And that image is, is, is strikingly ancient but modern at the same time, okay? So um, you can see that, that hey, there's, there are multi-story buildings here, right? If you look at this section over here, it's got four floors. So, um, in this structure, you see, again, this notion of the monumental um, colonnade, right? Or the colonnaded facades. You see the courtyards in the center and the buildings sort of surrounding the courtyards, you see the use of terrain at multiple levels. Because, see all these stairs over in here, right? This was at a higher level than the areas that were around it, OK? So taking a look at some of the reconstructed remains, right? This is uh, the north entrance to the palace. You can see the, the very distinctive um, sort of columns they have that are different than almost anything else. What do you guys notice about those columns? They, they taper down. Yeah. Very weird, right? So um, inside of the palaces, and there wasn't just one palace. There were many palaces in Crete. Gnosis happens to be the larger, grander one. OK. Um, there was the king's sort of quarters or the, the, the center of rule. And that space was called the Megaron, OK? Um, later on, the Megaron is going to be used as a precursor for early Greek, not pre-Greek, but Greek temples. So um, it was a rectangular hall. It had columns out in the front. You can see the little plan view up in here. And it, it had a, stay, a series of rooms that would create a processional, OK? And finally, in the back of the room was, was where the, the kings or the, the, the leader had their throne. There were these columns on the inside and an open thing, an open area in the middle for the fire to rise from the center. Here's a 3D cutaway view of the same thing. So you get an idea that, um, that it was a very ornate structure. They, they've been able to uncover some of the the sort of patterns and stuff that were used in making these things. So, <clears throat> sorry, my throat's going. Here are uh, some of the finishes that, that you would find inside of the throne room. All right, you can see that their, their artwork was pretty sophisticated at the time. When you compare it to like what the Egyptians were doing, right, um, they had some fairly sophisticated artwork. Um, some of the key architectural systems that were unparalleled at the time, okay, are listed down here. They had plumbing, they had drainage, they understood how light reflected. So they were able to bring light into spaces that would otherwise be dark, okay. Um, air distribution, they knew about the placement of windows, they understood cross ventilation. How do you keep a place cool by nature of wind? And that, in some ways, implies some knowledge of human thermal comfort and human physiology, right? We all know what wind chill is, right? So you could be in a space that's very comfortable if there's no air motion, right? And you maybe you have a sweater. But all of a sudden, if you take that sweater off and there's a strong breeze going through, the place that was previously comfortable now becomes cold. 
And so humans are only comfortable in a very narrow band. They have to do things to, to kind of adapt. And these people were sort of aware of that. Um, they dealt with this notion of scientific resistance in, the, in, in, in the, the theory that the rubble stone walls and the use of wood beams and stuff and the use of wood braces uh, were ways of dealing with seismic resistance. The structures were huge. You saw that picture. I mean, that, that looks like, like a modern, you know, sort of building. That's not a, that, that, that building is bigger than this one by a long shot. Okay. Um, and then finally, one of the things that was important about understanding the Minoan culture is that they did things for a reason. There were strategic ways of laying things out that were not just arbitrary or spiritual or um, superstitious. Okay, They did things from a strategic perspective in the planning and the orientation of their cities and buildings. So taking a look at... Um, the Palace of Gnosis, the Minoan columns, right? One of the things about it is the fact that it tapers down. We talked about that. And so different people have theorized different things. Um, you know, what? why do the columns taper down when every, every, every other column anywhere else tapers up? So some people thought that uh, originally that, that they were using wood Right, and so if you take wood and you cut it down and you, you put it on the ground, sometimes that wood will start to grow roots from the bottom, but it won't grow roots from the top. And so that's one theory. Um, different theory was that uh, these things became sort of symbolic of a whirlpool, since they were they were sort of uh, a seafaring nation. The whole idea of what was that thing called in Pirates of the Caribbean? The big whirlpool. Yeah. yeah, Pirates 3, wasn't it? Yeah. No, no, it's the big whirlpools where the, they get the two ships go in and they're firing at each other and they're going in a big circle. Never mind. Whatever, you guys know what I'm talking about. It's one of those whirlpooly things that suck stuff down. I, I'll think of the name. I'll even say it with a pirate accent when I think of it. Okay. Um, okay. I'll think of it. Wait, what? No, 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 wait, what's, stop, what's the time? Where are we in time? I still got a minute? Okay, I'm going to keep talking for a minute. I'm going to give you guys a break after this, okay? Still, no, nobody's snoring. That's good. It's good. I talk too loud to make you snore. All right, just take a look at this. So you can start to see the use of wood in addition to the stone. So they're using these wood beams, right? And they're using wood, what was thought to be originally wood columns, okay? as a means of taking some level of like ability to flex that stone doesn't have. Stones don't flex, but wood does, right? And so the use of wood above uh, or below the stonework and above the columns is one of those examples. Here you see two of them um, sort of in the reconstructed remains of, of the Palace of Gnosis. All right. Um, over here, we start to look at uh, some of the frescoes that were inside the palace. In addition to the king having a megaron at the Palace of Gnosis, there's also the queen's megaron. All right, so she had her little area also where she ruled from. Some additional artwork. Um, and again, I, I bring this to your, your attention so that you can see that there, there's a greater level of sophistication than what we see in the other cultures' depictions. Okay, um, one of the things about the Minoans, and I think I'm out of time, but uh, let me see. How many more? Nope. I got to stop it. All right. So one of the things about the Minoans, and I'm going to try and get this finished up, is that they were an affluent people. They were people that didn't just sort of subsist. Okay. And it's depicted in many of the artwork pieces that you see. All right, here are some of the frescoes from the palace. All right, and then I'm going to stop this here because after this we switch off to the Mycenaeans.